Hi, good evening, everyone. I'm Dr. Sing Kiong Fang uh, from Malaysia. I'll be co-chairing uh, this session uh, with uh, Paul from uh, Canada. And uh, we will have be having uh, six uh, speakers uh, today. Uh, I think Dr. Tony Dos Ramos uh, is uh, not here with us. Uh, yeah, let's start the, the first session. Uh, the first talk will be uh, by Professor Marlene Moster. She will be talking to us on a perfect uh, trabeculectomy. And then I will be talking on tips for glaucoma tube surgery. Uh, following uh, that will be surgery for pediatric uh, glaucoma by uh, Professor Beth Edmonds. And then uh, Professor Shamira Pereira from Singapore will be talking to us on difficult cataracts in uh, glaucoma patients. Uh, Paul will be talking to us on managing trabeculectomy uh, complications. And finally, uh, Professor Anton Homer from Austria will be talking to us on how to perform selective uh, laser trabeculoplasty. Hi, everybody. My name is Marlene Moster. I'm from Will's Eye Hospital. And my charge today is to talk to you about the perfect trabeculectomy. However, what constitutes the perfect trabeculectomy? The problem is there is no such thing. Why is that? Well, because there are so many variables that we just cannot control. What are they? First, conjunctival inflammation. Problems with flow through the trabeculectomy flap. Who will develop hypotony? Who will develop a choroidal detachment? And who will ultimately fail due to scarring? There are so many variables we can't control. However, in spite of all this, we can still come very close to a perfect trabeculectomy since 80% chance is possible of achieving an acceptable pressure at one year with the trap. How do we do it? Well, first of all, we don't need a block at all. I personally use topical and intracameral lidocaine or xylocaine, and I inject mitomycin C with non-preserved xylocaine on a 30 gauge needle. I use two different uh, sutures first, Tenno nylon or Ethicon on a 7707 needle or Adovicryl on a J974 needle. First, we're using a traction suture of Adovicryl. This is a J964 needle and we move the eye down. We're now injecting minimizing C one to one with lidocaine 0.4 milligrams per cc, a total of 0 0.2 with the lidocaine. We open up a fornix space flat, cauterize, and using a 67 blade followed by a 57 blade, we're able to create a nice half thickness flat. We always pre-place our sutures with 10 nylon. This is a 7707 Ethicon, and using a 30 degree sharp point blade, we make two radial cuts and then with Van S scissors, make a rectangular opening into the clear cornea and trabecular meshwork to assure we have a nice block. This is followed by an iridectomy. The pre-placed sutures are then tied in a slip knot fashion and the anterior chamber is deepened with balanced salt so we could see just how much egress of fluid is coming from the under the flap. We then tie the sutures that were pre-placed. This is a releasable suture passing through cornea to the sclera, then using the same suture of the flap to the adjacent side as if you were to put in a permanent suture but turn the needle around, go back, following the curve of the needle from the sclera into clear cornea, and you can tie this as tightly as you want. If the pressure is high, you may want to tie it very tightly, and if it's low, not so tightly. We then put in three to four knots, and we cut it at its base, 
using additional lidocaine. This is a blitz anesthesia technique. We then use the other half of the J97480 Vicryl uh, suture to recreate a limbal, a limbal incision, as you see here, but obviously this is a fornix base flat. So we go up, down, over, that's the mantra in order to reestablish the conjunctiva at the limbus and assure that it's watertight. When you go over, it's a very, very light, small bite, so as not to cause any uh, defects within the trap flap. We pull this up tight, we finish it, cut it, uh, the knots, there are four knots on either side, take out the traction suture, and then in this case, we're adding some uh, non-preserved triamcinolone, the bleb forms nicely, we test it to make sure it's side down negative and the case is complete. Now, I think it's important to go over some of these steps just a bit slower, such as removal of the block if you choose to do this. You remove the block with a sharp point blade followed by Van Ness scissors. Change hands with the scissors so that you don't crush the tissue as you move anteriorly toward the limbus. It's important that you also dissect the posterior edge of the block from the peripheral iris or the ciliary body and pull towards you when you cut out the rectangular piece. The iris can then be uh, examined and using Sterngill scissors, a iridectomy follows. You can see the ciliary processes here. The sutures have been previously placed, and this is important because when the eye is hard, you won't induce any additional astigmatism, and it'll allow you to tighten these up. Look how much fluid is flowing, too much. So we will tighten the back sutures and then do a releasable sutures, which gives me perfect control of the pressure in the post-operative period. So I'm taking a bite of the 1009 line through the cornea to the sclera, and then across the flap, from the flap to the adjacent sclera. This is all a continuous suture. Turn the needle around, follow the curve of the needle, starting at the limbus, ending up in clear cornea. And then by tying it, you can tie it as tightly as you want. Sometimes I'll remove this the first day postoperatively, most of the time by two weeks postoperatively. And then when you have enough fluid, but not too much, you can then close in any way you'd like. Now, what if you don't want to cut out the block? Well, you don't have to. And oftentimes when I'm combining this with a phaco emulsification, I won't cut out the block, but I'll use a Kelly punch like you see here to punch back. The secret is to get just a small amount of bleeding so that you know you've gone back far enough. But the trick is to go to the side as you see here, because the closer you are to the edge, the better your flow will be, but the releasable suture will control it. Now, how do you close? I showed you the Vicryl suture technique, but oftentimes we'll just use a 10 nylon suture, taking a bite of the cornea at the limbus to the conjunctiva twice to establish the wound, and then going all the way around just under the edge of the conjunctiva ending up just where we starting started, pulling up on both suture edges, tying, and the wound will implode. It will be watertight, and you can put a mattress suture on the other side just for extra safety. Now, for those of you who don't like fornix base flaps, even though we at Will's Eye have it almost exclusively turned over to Fornix base. A limbal base flap can easily be adjusted by taking the 
eight albicral suture, locking each bite in the tenons, coming out through the conjunctiva, and then non-locking the conjunctival sutures as you go back to the original start of the wound. This is 10 millimeters back and probably will never be seen again. Uh, so you must make sure it is watertight. And here you have a nice blip. So then what about post-operative instructions? We use antibiotics for one week and then stop and we taper steroids. We start at four times a day for two weeks, tapering down over a total of eight weeks. I recommend a shield for one week and the releasable suture is usually cut by two weeks time. The vicro will dissolve all by itself. So in summary, decide on the best technique for you. And when you do decide, Pay attention to all the details because the devil is in the details. And when you do, you can approach trap perfection because that is the goal for all of us. Well, I think I'll stop here. Thank you very much. Dr. Seng Kiong Fang from Isaac Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. Welcome to the WOC virtual. And uh, this is part of the video symposium, symposium for uh, glaucoma surgery. And I'll be uh, talking for on the tips for glaucoma tube surgery. And the other speakers will be talking about tips for other surgeries. I have no financial uh, interest in the devices uh, that is going to be presented. Since I only have uh, eight minutes, I will go through quickly uh, the principles of uh, glaucoma drainage devices, which is actually uh, creating an alternate aqueous pathway by channeling aqueous from the interior chamber through a long tube to a equatorial plate inserted under the conjunctiva that promotes uh, black formation. And there are many uh, tubes av available, as most of you know, and these are all modification of uh, the Maltino implant. And uh, what is familiar to us are the uh, Maltino single and double plate, uh, the bar belt, and the cheaper version of the bar belt, which is called the Aravin uh, Echoes Drainage uh, Implant, the Ahmed, and uh, most recently we have the Paul Glaucoma Implant. So I will be talking more on the choice of glaucoma implants and also on the newer implant called uh, Paul Glaucoma Implant. So what is the choice of the glaucoma drainage device? And uh, I mean, there are many studies that have been conducted and I personally prefer the Barbell, mainly because they have better long-term uh, outcome. Uh, they have larger surface area, but because it doesn't have a wow, we might need to uh, do some uh, flow restriction uh, measures to prevent hypotony in, in the initial post-operative phase. And uh, I have used uh, Ahmed as well, but because uh, uh, it is a smaller surface area, I find that uh, it, the long-term results are not so good. But now uh, there is a uh, uh, latest update of the Ahmad call uh, Clear Path, which is uh, recently available in some countries. And this is a sur bigger surface area, uh, non-valve, low-lying plate, and have a pre-placed uh, record, which is a 4-0 proline. I will show you some uh, flow restrictive uh, measures that is available for uh, barbell. And uh, I will later on show you uh, uh, some a video on uh, PGI as well. So this is uh, just a video to show you the flow restrictive uh, measures for, for the barbell. And uh, mainly I would use a 7-0 uh, Vicro suture, as you can see in the video, to occlude the, the tube completely at the, at the junction uh, as it goes into the plate uh, with the 7-0 proline. And once the, I, I make sure that there's no flow, I will use uh, the 7-0 proline needle to create Sherwood slits, as you can see here, 
uh, the echoes it will initially flow through this uh, Sherwood slits and later on once the 7O proline the dissolves then the tube will function uh, as, as, as normally. So now I would just like to introduce uh, Paul's glaucoma implant, which is actually uh, patented by Professor Paul Chiu uh, from uh, NUH in Singapore. As you can see here, the plate size is about 342 uh, millimeter square, which is in between uh, that of Ahmed and uh, Bauvel. I will show you some of the parameters here. You can see Ahmed is 184, uh, Bauvel is 350 millimeter square. Uh, the, the size of the tube is also smaller, uh, both outer diameter and internal diameter. So this uh, will cause, uh, will give less risk of uh, tube erosion and corneal touch and also prevent uh, hypotony. So this is the Paul glaucoma implant. I will show you a video uh, for this uh, Paul glaucoma implant. And I would like to thank uh, Professor Keith Button from Morfield for sharing uh, this video. As you can see in this video, uh, the Paul glaucoma implant is also uh, made of uh, silicone and uh, its surface area is, I mentioned earlier, 342 millimeter square and it has got a smaller internal and outer, out, outer diameter. Uh, the flow restrictive measures uh, for Paul normally is by stenting with a 6-0 um, proline and uh, before stenting, normally we would like to prime uh, the tube as shown in the video. And after stenting the tube, uh, we put in uh, the plate as uh, usually done with the other uh, 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 glaucoma drainage devices. And for, for this, uh, uh, we need to anchor the, the, the plate either through the anchoring holes or as is shown in, in, in the video, that uh, is, uh, the anchoring is uh, uh, circumferentially placed uh, by 9O proline to prevent lateral and anterior posterior movement of the plate. And you can see here uh, the implant is uh, a bit softer when you put in, so you might need the 3 O uh, silk retracting uh, uh, the tenons uh, to aid the exposure. Uh, going going along, uh, we normally now uh, would put a, a 6O proline uh, to stand the tube and so that uh, you have uh, uh, to prevent the immediate post-operative uh, hypotony. As you can see here now, the, the entrance of the into the anterior chamber is also using a smaller bore needle and normally I would uh, use a 25 uh, gauge needle as uh, opposed to the bow belt, we, we use a 23 gauge needle uh, as shown in the other uh, video here. So as, as time is uh, moving on, I would like to just uh, uh, and, uh, show you the post-operative uh, uh, results. You can see here, uh, the tube is uh, smaller and away from the cornea and uh, the one year result of this uh, study is now uh, being accepted for publication in uh, ophthalmology glaucoma uh, by our uh, group together with Paul Chiu and uh, Keith Button. Uh, thank you for listening to, to this uh, presentation. And I would like to acknowledge uh, Paul Chiu, uh, Keith Button, and uh, the rest of the, his team, including uh, Dr. Victor Ko for this uh, presentation. Thank you. Hello, my name is Beth Edmonds and I've been asked to give you a small video symposium masterclass specifically looking at surgery for pediatric glaucoma. I have no conflicts of interest. So why? in a section like this, would there be a separate part for surgery in children? The reason is several fold. Firstly, children with glaucoma grow into adults with eyes that show the effects of that childhood glaucoma. In other words, you will meet ophthalmic eyes and eyes that have undergone previous surgeries in all ages of patients. Secondly, 
children are not simply small adults. And so assuming adult surgical approaches may be as safe when performed in children can lead to unanticipated difficulties. Furthermore, childhood onset glaucoma results in bophthalmus, sometimes coexisting with other pathologies and the effects of previous surgeries. And so these eyes are at high risk of surgical complications. However, the silver lining to the story is that we do have surgeries that make a difference. And if executed in a timely and safe manner, we can provide the opportunity of a sighted lifetime. Bophthalmus refers to that large stretched eye with floppy thin sclera and cornea produced by the effects of elevated pressure on the immature tissues of the young developing globe. This stretching results in the tendency of the globe to collapse during surgery, which creates a situation fertile for rapidly compounding complications. The collapsed eye makes surgical instrumentation more difficult, resulting in inadvertent trauma to tissues, hemorrhage, which may affect the surgeon's view, promotes lens dislocation when stretched sonules are subject to changes in ocular volume or overfilling, the risk of vitreous prolapse, suprachoroidal hemorrhage, etc. Furthermore, incisions in these abnormal globes do not self-seal and suture tracts from spatulated needles may leak, which these eyes do not tolerate well. Tissues may be friable and scarred, contributing further to the difficulty of suture closure. The effects of bophthalmus and previous surgeries also result in distorted architecture and landmarks, which is especially relevant when identifying structures such as Schlem Canal and the ciliary body, which may be crucial to specific procedures. So this video masterclass session allows me to demonstrate two techniques that I have found very helpful. The first is the use of an AC maintainer during incisional surgery, and the second is the use of transillumination when performing cyclodiode. So we'll go to our first video. The purpose of an anterior chamber maintainer is to connect a bottle of balanced salt solution to the anterior chamber during surgery in a way that allows safe manipulation of flow and IOP during surgery. The system is prepped by connecting a three-way tap to IV tubing, which connects to a bottle of BSS mounted on an adjustable pole. The other component of the system is a Lewicki cannula with fine tubing that is connected to the system. Ultimately, the flow will be regulated by the three-way tap, not the roller clamp on the IV tubing system, which stays fully open. It is important to ensure that there are no bubbles in the system and that the fluid flows freely during the setup. Ultimately, there are two ways that the balanced salt solution can be adjusted. One is by raising or lowering the bottle on the adjustable pole, which increases or decreases the pressure or the amount of fluid flowing into the eye. And the other is by switching the infusion on and off, which allows the assessment of the eye's fluid dynamics at any point during surgery. A 22 or 23 gauge needle or MVR blade is used to enter the anterior chamber. This is directed obliquely in a phacic eye to avoid any inadvertent lens trauma. Myocol is often used in these surgeries to constrict the pupil. The Lewicki cannula is twiddled between one's fingers, scrawling it into the anterior chamber. Be careful not to drive the tip of the cannula into the stroma. Approaching the initial incision with bevel down to get the tip introduced into the paracentesis and then twiddling it so it is bevel up at the point of entering the AC and following the trajectory of the paracentesis helps. In pseudo or aphakic eyes, radial entry is fine. Once in the eye, the infusion can be turned on at the three-way tap and the tension in the AC assessed to ensure that it is appropriate. Here are three examples of an AC maintainer system in action applicable to any incisional surgery. The first will show the maintenance of a formed stable anterior chamber when operating on an open eye, such as during the PI and sclerostomy of a trabeculectomy. The second will show how flow dynamics can be assessed, allowing one to alter wound closure to obtain optimal flow, such as in a trabeculectomy, or to ensure a watertight closure, as in most other incisions or wounds. Thirdly, altering the tension in the globe can help with achieving tight, non-leaking suturing. And an example of this on a trabeculectomy flap will be shown. So firstly, maintaining the anterior chamber during open eye situations. 
In preparation, the infusion is turned on, the bottle is set high, and then the eye is entered. The high flow of fluid is used to keep the structure stable and avoids collapse or hypotony as the incisions are made, especially important in bophthalmus. As well as this, you can see how nicely the iris presents for the PI because it follows the physiological flow. And also how the free, clean flow of fluid from the sclerostomy can be appreciated without any anxiety about the AC flattening or creating undue urgency to close the eye. Now you may ask, why not simply use viscoelastic to maintain the anterior chamber? This leads me to demonstrate the second great advantage. BSS allows one to assess flow and wound closure in a way that viscoelastic would not. This is particularly crucial in the bophthalmic eye and in children for whom we want a tight closure, unlike adults where we may encourage a greater seepage of fluid from the flap. The goal of the construction of the trabeculectomy flap is to provide posterior direction of flow from under the back of the scleral flap with no leakage anteriorly from the lateral aspects of the flap. The AC maintainer helps when testing these incisions to modify both the quantity and the direction of the flow. The bottle height is set just above the eye to maintain the AC with approximately a physiological IOP. Once the flap sutures have been tied, their tension can be assessed by the briskness of flow from the posterior flap border. Sometimes it is helpful to switch the infusion off, wait a little to ensure the AC maintains itself without excessive leakage, and when there's no more fluid oozing out, switch the infusion on again. This allows confirmation that the point of earliest flow is indeed posterior and direction, and to ensure that it is a slow or limited ooze. The integrity of the lateral flap incisions can also be tested this way. You can see here while staunching flow from other parts of the flap, we can probe the sides of the flap for leakage, which if found can be sutured. Wax cell sponges are well suited for this type of fine calibrated detection of fluid. One can therefore continuously judge the flow or leakage from the wound assessed and the integrity of its closure without having to repeatedly fill the AC or mask these dynamics with viscoelastic. Thirdly, one can use this dynamic system to assist with suturing. Ophthalmic eyes gape around needle tracks, cheese wire, and leak easily. Laramella rather than full thickness suturing is therefore recommended in these eyes. When tightening sutures, switching off the infusion allows the eye to soften, which enables suture tying without cheese wiring. As soon as the knot is locked, the infusion can be switched on again to plump up the eye and keep it safe. And once finished, one always closes the incision tightly because one's wanting to avoid leakage. This is the only point of hypotony during the surgery and therefore is brief and hopefully not sight threatening. The second video that I will show you is my other small tip. So the second video is a very brief one to show the value of transillumination in cyclophotocoagulation. I alluded to the fact how in bophthalmus the landmarks are distorted and in eyes that have had previous surgery there might be scarring that can alter the configuration of the anterior chamber the stretched limbus and so one wants to be sure that one is indeed applying the probe to the ciliary body. A way to identify this is by using transillumination with a bright light in a dimmed room and as you can see here this allows a ring of light to appear around the limbus and where the junction of that ring of light and darkness is where the ciliary body will be found. One can therefore apply the cyclodiode probe at that junction wherever it might be and in that way be sure to be treating the ciliary body and not another organ. This is particularly helpful in the bophthalmic eye um, and also as I say when there has been distorted landmarks for other reasons. Well I hope the session has been useful to show two ways that I employ techniques in both adult and childhood surgery to keep me safe when operating on the difficult eye affected by childhood glaucoma. Thank you very much. Hi, Shamira Pereira here from SNEC. I'll be speaking on how to FACO in the shallowest of eyes. Here are my financial disclosures. I'll be taking you through some cases from the shallow, shallower, and shallowest ACs. In a word, this is all going to be about visualization and bag management. Here are the three mechanisms of sublux lenses. 
Doing these cases involve careful preparation and optimization. You can see in the examination of this case that when the patient lies down, the lens tilts backwards. Here, this is a warning sign. If you want to do a PI before the operation, do it judiciously. The lens is right up against the iris and can be breached. In this case, the cornea is not quite ready yet. This case has a very short eye with a very large lens. The lens is moving around a lot. And you can see that the lens takes up one third of the axial length of the eye. The lens subsequently is very wobbly and the zonule is floppy. Here you can see an atypical case of angle closure in a 27-year-old male, no less. And here it's because of a spherophakia. Knowing this is important because the lens can trampoline around during the phaco section. Here, it can just come out with IA. Here are some of the unusual features of APAC that you need to prepare for. In this video, you can see a colloid AC. When you inject BSS, you can suddenly see it in the AC because of the different specific gravity. The AC is full of protein. In this video, you can see why it's important not to overinflate the shallow AC because, as you can see here, the cornea goes white. And here, whilst I'm desperately trying to cause some of the fluid to come out to make the cornea clear again, the eye is still hard and I'm finding it very difficult. Only when I press and for the second time does the fluid come out on the cornea clear. Be careful of bouncing lens syndromes. Here, as the aspiration goes up, the lens comes forwards. Watch out for anterior capsule bulging and folds. In this case, you can see I've misjudged it horribly. And you can see there is a tense capsule. As I start the rexis, it tears out. And you can see the archetypal Argentinian flag sign appearing. Now, this is what I should have done. Pierce the anterior chamber with a needle and suck out the fluid in the capsular blag. Once this is done, you can gently move the needle to the side, and then turn it into the start of your capsular rexis. See the folds here? This is where there's going to be some zonular loss. This lens is quite wobbly. You can see the folds appearing in the anterior capsule. This is a huge bag, which you'll see later. And you can see the wrinkles in the anterior capsule, demarking out where it's the most weak. This case has got four clock hours of zonulysis. And you can see to counteract this, I've decentered the rexis towards me. The zonulysis is at the top of the picture. Once the capsular rexis is done, I need to stabilize the bag. And for this, I've used, in this case, some iris hooks. The lens is actually quite soft, so I managed to fake it fairly easily. The hooks are placed in the bag to stabilize the bag, but yet I haven't put in a capsular tension ring yet. As I'm doing the IA, you can see the bag moving around dramatically, and you can see that it appears like it's almost going to be broken with the amount of fluid going into the eye. At this point, I decided to go and put the capsular tension ring in. But of course, I probably should have put it in earlier. When you put the capsular tension ring in, you must be able to support the area of maximal loss. Once the lens goes in, you can see that that decentered rexis becomes central again, and the lens is in perfect position. Here's a case with four clock hours of zonulysis. The lens is not wobbly, and I use a needle to start my capsular rexis. I proceed with a kawaii forceps, which is very low profile and good for these kind of cases. The iris hooks are holding the iris open to allow me a good view. I'm repositioning two of those hooks inside the capsule to stabilize the bag this time. I proceed with a primary chop or stop and chop procedure to dismantle the lens, and the lens comes out quite easily. Next, a capsular tension ring goes in. Again, superiorly to support the area of maximal loss. Once this is done, you can put the lens in centrally. And again, the CCC centers up very nicely. Lens is stable. Moving on to more difficult cases. You must change your case into one you can deal with. Here, it's important to use things like digital ocular massage, intravenous mannitol to decompress the bag and the vitreous. Some people like to do a single port vitrectomy to create space, but beware of damage to the crystalline lens and the retina. In this phacomorphic case, the CTR goes in before the phaco. You can see the amount of zonulysis at the top of the picture. As I press down, you can see there's probably about four clock hours or worse, but this time I'm putting the capsule tension ring in manually without the injector. Again, trying to stabilize the bag as much as possible so that I can perform a safe FACO. My method for FACO, once the 
caps attention ring is in is usually a stop and chop or a primary chop. A primary chop works very well in this particular case. You can see it cleaves nicely and you've got two fragments which you can dismantle and remove. The rexus is also centered up as well. The lens goes in the bag. I've sutured the wounds here for extra stability. Small leaks can mean vitreous comes out. Have full knowledge of all the available options that are currently on the market. Here's a case with seven to eight clock hazards on your lysis now, and there's pigment behind the lens as it's been flapping forwards and backwards in this acute attack. You can see that the, the lens is markedly sublux, and you can see the edge of the lens appearing at the pupil margin. Again, I decenter the capsorexis and use a kawaii forceps to do this, as it's very low profile and doesn't allow the AC to shallow as much as when you use a utratus. At this level of zonulysis, you've got to be careful that you're not pulling off more zonules, and sometimes you may need to use counter traction with another instrument as well. Once this is done, I inject the capture tension ring in again to support the area of loss. But as you can see here, it's going into the equator, and the equator is above the iris over some part of this heavily sublux lens. I push the lens down to get it into the right position, obviously not too much. And then I can proceed with the FACO with a capsitensis segment on an iris hook in this position to stabilize the weakest areas. Once the lens goes in, you can see it remains quite stable. However, that's not the end of the case. You still need to stabilize the bag for the longer term. Here I am removing the SLM tangentially to remove it from around the CTR, sometimes it can get trapped. This is the Hoffman Poffick being performed with a mini blade. And you can see that you need to create a two millimeter depth pocket because the sutures that I'm putting in to stabilize this lens in this CTS or Ahmed segment are being placed into that pocket, dragged out, and so the knot is gonna be invisibly held inside that Hoffman pocket. The lens centers up quite nicely at the end of the case. Now, moving on to even more sublux cases, you can see when you've got to eight clock hours of zonulysis, you can see you definitely need a capture tension ring and a capture tension segment. And I prefer to use it in a Hoffman pocket. Here's the rexus going around as usual. Here I'm using a utrata, but the lens is being well behaved here. It's not moving forwards at all. The rexus can be completed with one hand and I complete the rest of it with the kawaii forceps. Once this is done, the capture tension ring goes in again to support the bag as much as possible. You don't want to tear off any more zonules at this point. Once this is done, the FACO can proceed and the lens is being held upwards by the iris hook holding the capture tension segment. The lens centers up nicely. I'm using a LRI blade, limbal relaxing incision blade, diamond knife to create a partial thickness corneal incision. Then I can make the Hoffman pocket with the mini blade as per usual. It's important to get a large landing zone because when you put your sutures through, they have got to be inside that pocket. The suture I'm using is a tenoproline and the lens senses up nicely here. Now in the most extreme situation here is an APAC attack with end field touch of the lens in a post fail trap eye from abroad. Here, there's lenticular touch to the endothelium and the cornea is going to decompensate. I find some space on the ASOCT to find my incision into the anterior chamber, avoiding some of the PAS that's present almost all around. I create some space with some viscoelastic, but it's just coming straight out the wound. It's not easy to give me some space to operate in. In some ways, this is a bit of a godsend because at least I know that I don't need to be careful with the cornea. This patient is gonna need a DSEC. I form a capsulorexis and a capsulotomy on one side because I can't have a good view here to see what I'm doing. Nevertheless, I can still remove the remnants and proceed with a FACO despite the poor blue view, even despite the vision blue in this case. I enlarge the wound to take out some of the later fragments because it's becoming very cloudy and my view, as you can see, is very cloudy. The SLM comes out easily. I'm being careful not to tug on any of the strands of the capsulotomy on one side. The hooks are in the iris to give me a better view. The lens goes in. At this stage, I scrape the epithelium to get a better view, but I should have done this earlier. And I put sutures in the wound. 
it's important to have good tailored post-op management. Remember, any of the complications that can happen after FACA are exaggerated in these inflamed eyes. So in summary, make sure you have careful preparation, do meticulous cautious surgery, preempting problems, and know the options available. Also, tailor your post-op management. Thank you very much. I wish you the best of luck with your complex cases. My name is Paul Arsimuc from the University of Montreal, and today we'll be talking about managing or avoiding complications of filtration surgery. And here are some of my financial disclosures, which may be relevant to this topic. There is a myriad of complications potentially intra or postoperatively uh, with trabeculectomy. Let's review a few that we can actually try to avoid and treat. Sometimes we're in the arena here, we have uh, we're the matador, we're doing a great job, the bull is there, and the eye heals very nicely. This is a very nice looking bleb. Sometimes you do the same surgery and things don't turn out so well. Look at this very ugly localized ischemic encapsulated bleb. Some pearls for managing glaucoma filtration are to prepare the ocular surface, avoid preservatives, and treat um, this ocular surface as well. Let's go through some of them. We know that the more drops and the longer patients have drops, uh, the more likely that their trabeculae will fail. Our colleague, Katie Bird in Toronto, has shown that the cumulative dose of BAK is also associated with failure of trabeculectomy. And we prefer using um, no preservatives or less invasive preservatives in our glaucoma drops long-term to avoid trabeculectomy or filtration failure. We know that there's inflammation caused by uh, these medications that we use. And what we also know is that we can pretreat the ocular surface and decrease the conjunctival inflammation. And this increases the success rate of trabeculectomy. This was also shown uh, by Ingeborg Stallman's group in Belgium, where patients pretreated with steroids for a month had less needling and less um, pressure lowering medications at one year. What about injecting steroids or using prolonged steroids postoperatively? Well, actually studies have shown the opposite. Um, what is known is that if you give a lot of steroids for a long time, you may pre-select um, these super fibroblasts and they may actually increase encapsulation. And we should probably consider not using steroids or potent steroids for a very long time after trabeculectomy. It is also known that the site of incision, Peng Ka showed us uh, that limbus-based blebs in children are more prone to developing cystic-like blebs. And in the surgery safe system, we open the conjunctiva at the limbus. Uh, we apply a large sponge posterior to the site of the uh, scleral flap, and we make sure that we don't dissect too anteriorly. What we do want is posterior flow. We can do something very similarly in our patients undergoing filtration with Zen. Here we're injecting mitomycin and xylocaine, and instead of doing the ab internal approach, we will be inserting the Zen ab external. This way we avoid nasal blebs. We can also avoid hemorrhaging of vessels because we see the, exactly where we're going inside. And we can also have a very long external uh, Zen bleb. Here's an example of a very successful Zen where we see that this bleb is very posterior. So the shorter that we can keep the Zen in the anterior chamber and the longer on the outside, the less likely you are to get cystic blebs. We also know that the rate of that aqueous humor comes out of the eye also influences the rate of encapsulation. Tony Maltino, so the Maltino theory in the Otago Glaucoma Surgery Outcome Study, hypothesizes that the inflammatory factors or the rate will activate our fibroblasts and will cause encapsulation. And that's why uh, we've preferred to perform non-penetrating glaucoma surgery where aqueous humor percolates very slowly through the trabeculodesmae window and it induces less fibrosis. 
And in the top right here, you'll see someone post canaloplasty, for instance, with almost no bleb, a great pressure of 10. This is a young nurse, 18 years old, and she's you know several years out now. Um, and I think that having less flow, similar to a bare belt implant, um, perhaps why they encapsulate less than Ahmed implants. Another thing that we can perform are adjustable sutures. So initially, we want to be very tight uh, postoperatively, and once the inflammatory phase and those inflammatory factors are gone, uh, Peng Ka has also shown us, then we loosen the sutures on the scleral flap and we'll get a much lower and diffuse blep. And we really control the outflow of aqueous humor in these cases. Whenever there is redness or inflammation of the conjunctiva, uh, we are quite liberal in our use of anti vegf medications. Uh, we prefer that to um, anti-metabolites postoperatively because we tend to avoid those uh, ocular surface toxicity side effects of 5-FU. And here's a patient with the corkscrew vessels. And on the right-hand side, we see that after two injections of Aston, the blab is looking less vascular and will probably survive much longer term. Um, some studies have actually uh, compared 5-FU and bevacizumab and shown that they are equivalent. Another thing we can use during surgery and eyes prone to scarring can be either the implantation of a collagen matrix, which in this case was ologen, uh, or perhaps amniotic membrane has also been shown to decrease inflammation. So if your patient has inflammatory conjunctiva or a previously scarred trabeculectomy, uh, this can be considered as well. Overfiltration can definitely cause patient discomfort. Um, and here we see two cases of corneal delin. Um, when uh, the right-hand image, this patient is complaining, they always have this bleb. Notice that when she lifts her eyelid, you'll notice a little pop, there's a little pop of fluid. And to treat bleb dysesthesia, definitely we have to use intense artificial tears, punctal plugs. Uh, sometimes we actually implant uh, gold weights in the patient's superior eyelid to flatten the bleb. And many of our patients with bleb dysesthesia have found much more comfort with these um, eyelid weights. Bleb over, over filtration, such as this case, huge, huge bleb, obviously this patient is very uncomfortable, can also be treated with compression sutures. Sometimes we call this the Palmberg compression suture. And we see this patient in the left-hand image, huge bleb nasally, uh, eyelid pushed inferiorly. And here we put a nice 10 nylon suture, uh, which flattens the bleb against the sclera and the patient's symptoms resolved. Uh, for overfiltration, we can also do transconjunctival uh, nylon sutures through the scleral flap. There's a great video on AAO by our own Marlene Moster. Um, and uh, this described by uh, Norbert Pfeiffer. Uh, here we see one in one of his original series, a patient with a low pressure overfiltering bleb. Uh, they put in three or four 10 nylon sutures and those get incorporated into the bleb. Um, you keep the patient on antibiotics, uh, and it's rare to have to remove these nylon sutures. And we see that the bleb is flattened and the pressure has rised. Sometimes with a huge bleb, we can also make a small window. Here we're making a window simply with some vena scissors, and then we'll be able to squeeze the fluid out, and the patient has immediate resolution of her symptoms. These were back in the pre-corona days where patients weren't uh, using their masks. So here we're milking the fluid out. Uh, another technique are uh, cryopexy. So you can use cautery. We can do a little conjunctival barbecue. Uh, and this also flattens the bleb, gets the fluid out, and also can help resolve patient's symptoms. Um, another technique used for overfiltering blebs has been the injection of blood, autologous blood, into the bleb. Uh, this can also uh, be performed um, to increase the patient's intraocular pressure. Here, the game is almost over. The patient has the famous ring of steel. Fibroblasts have choked off the bleb, and now the bleb in the right-hand case is so choked off that it's growing upwards like a mushroom and is actually growing onto the cornea. So this is way too late. Uh, when you see encapsulated blebs and you notice they're getting thinner, one must needle them. And so we usually freeze with xylocaine and then with a small 30 or 27 gauge needle, 
perform uh, micropunctures through that fibrotic wall. This flattens the bleb and avoids it from growing onto the cornea or from becoming uh, or developing late leaks. And usually, so this is also a late presentation of an encapsulated thin bleb, uh, which did develop a leak. Fluid can't come out. It's stuck in the small little bleb. It grows upwards, as we said, like a mushroom. It creates a thin wall, uh, and that's why the leaks are present. When you do have a presence of bleb leaks, chronic um, late-term leaks, one can also use MMP inhibitors. Joel Schumann actually has a patent to use doxycycline, and we often, in patients with ugly, ischemic-looking blebs, use doxycycline for a few months in order to decrease that inflammation and those inflammatory factors, and often this helps resolve uh, chronic bleb leaks. Sometimes these uh, have to be completely removed, and one can slip uh, conjunctiva further down, and we call that the little conj hoodie. We've also described a technique where um, very uh, hypotenuse ischemic looking blebs have been cross-linked, um, and uh, other groups have also found that cross-linking of blebs long-term can also be beneficial. Another very common uh, effect of trabeculectomy is that it can fail. The beauty of having a previous scleral flap is that at any point we can just simply freeze the eye and again perform needling. In this case, not of the bleb, but actually needling under the scleral flap. Here we see that we're in the anterior chamber and that way we can revive our bleb. So in some cases I prefer not to put uh, micro stents in cases where I definitely want long-term filtration uh, and having this nice non-penetrating or trabeculectomy flap here enables us to needle the patient even years later. In order to avoid choroidal detachment, we should keep our patients in reverse Trendelenburg position. That way we decrease the episcleral venous pressure, especially in patients with, you know, uh, larger uh, bellies. Uh, definitely you should suture your flaps tightly. When we're going from a pressure of 40 to a pressure of 5, that patient will develop choroidal detachment. So make sure that your flap initially has uh, tight sutures that you can loosen if they're adjustable or laser or cut uh, later on. Um, also, do not let the eye shallow during the surgery. Uh, definitely keep the eye filled with viscoelastic. Avoiding that initial period of hypotony um, will decrease the rate of aqueous misdirection uh, or malignant glaucoma. We also have to control a patient's blood pressure, their anxiety, and sometimes we should pause their anticoagulation um, if possible. We should also consider removing the lens early in angle closure glaucoma. Uh, even if we perform trabeculectomy in this case, uh, obviously the culprit here is uh, this large, large lens which is pushing things forward uh, or loose zonules. And in both cases, we see that here with a thin intraocular lens in the lower right image, uh, the angle has now opened up. Finally, the best way to avoid glaucoma filtration complications is to avoid performing these surgeries. One can use cyclodestructive procedures like the micropulse CPC, uh, or we can use, we have an array of uh, canal-based mix procedures, be they trabecular excision or the implantation of different stents. On the left-hand side, we'll be implanting uh, a few eye stents. On the right-hand side, we're implanting the hydrus microstent. Uh, it is not natural for aqueous humor to filter under uh, conjunctiva, uh, but it is natural for it to filter through trabecular meshwork, through uh, Schlem's canal, and into the collector system channel. Sometimes we do feel like Don Quixote. We're always battling this unseen enemy, which is the healing response. Uh, hopefully some of the advice we've given today will be useful in your practice. Thank you for your attention. And as welcome from Vienna, my name is Tony Hommer. I'm an ophthalmologist and I'm specialized in glaucoma. I'm working in hospital in and I'm working in a private office. I'm specialized in glaucoma. 80% of my patients are glaucoma patients. We are participating in phase three studies. We are participating in evaluations of new techniques, new surgeries, and of course, 
in laser treatment as well. My financial disclosure, I have giving, I'm giving a lot of lectures for different companies. I have no bonds, no stocks. All the machines and devices that we have are either paid by the hospital or myself. I didn't got anything for free or for a better price. For this particular talk, I want to give a laser disclosure as well. That means that I'm performing other laser tobacco plastic for more than 30 years, and I'm performing selective laser tobacco plastic for more than three years in the meantime. When we're looking now, when we think about selective laser tobacco plastic, there are some considerations we have to think about at the beginning. The one is what type of glaucoma is it? And is a laser actually a good option? What is the target pressure? Are there any contraindications? Is the medication an alternative? And what is the patient's preference? This is an important thing we have to discuss with the patient as well. What do people like? Maybe some people like more laser, maybe some people like more medications. We should discuss it. In the beginning, we should look what type of glaucoma is it that this patient is suffering from? Because if he or she has open angle glaucoma, ocular hypertensive, tudex relation, or pigment dispersion, SLT is indeed an option. With normal tension glaucoma, it's maybe not the ideal option in SLT. For sure, SLT is no option in angle closure, neovascular, congenital glaucoma, or secondary glaucomas, something like trauma, post traumatic or uveitic glaucomas. When we look to the target question, we have to look which is the target question we want to reach with this patient. Because we have to expect that SLT will lower the intraocular pressure by 20 to 25% from baseline, or 3 to 8 millimeters of mercury. We will have a stronger IOP lowering effect if we have a higher baseline at the beginning. But we shouldn't forget there is a loss of efficacy, by the way, very similar to medication to monotherapies, especially to better blockers. And there is no difference in the efficacy of the SLT in race, gender, fake status, or age. And we have to discuss it with the patient. And so there are some contraindications like some glaucoma types, some patients who cannot sit quiet enough for the treatment, even if it takes only a very few minutes. And of course, you need a really good visualization of the trabecular meshwork. If this is not the case, SLT is no option. Now, how is it to perform? It's with this Q-switch, neodymium yuck laser, and you have a pulse, a very short pulse duration. This is the reason why you don't find histological changes that much. You have a spot size, which is pretty big, 400 mu, and you have a pulse energy that you can change between 0.2 to 1.4 millijoules. It's based on this little system. It is hard to recommend now. It is actually that you should perform 360 degrees. At the beginning, it was discussed as well, 180 and later on 180. But we know now the IOP lowering effect is much better if you make from the very beginning 360 degrees with 100 non-overlapping spots. There is a discussion if you should give apaclonidine before or after the treatment. I'm not really sure why, it's, at least in our country, this is not popular. You can consider as well that you give one tablet of acetosolamide or if you give one drop of timolol. The patient should sit on the slit lamp and get topical anesthesia, and you have the go on your lens and you're focusing on the trabecular meshwork. And you should start with about 0 0.8 millijoule. And if you have a cavitation bubble, that you can see, then you will reduce by 0 0.1 millijoule. If you have no cavitation, then you will increase by 0 0.1 millijoule. And you should then maintain the energy just below the bubble formation. And again, it should be 360 degrees and not overlapping. Uh, there is a discussion if you should give afterwards, postoperatively for a few days, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drops. But on the other side, you want to have something like a low dose inflammation afterwards. So it is not really clear if it is if it makes sense or not. Keep in mind that you can have complications with SLT as well. They are not frequent. They are, the mild ones are frequent, but they are mild, like uh, anterior chamber inflammation or discomfort in some patients have an intraocular pressure spike afterwards after the treatment, which was down afterwards. Uh, of course, you can have redness and pain and, and so on. You can have really severe ones as well, like anterior synechia or choroidal effusion or cystoid macular edema is described in the literature. But this is, of course, something very rare, but we should not forget it. Repeatability is a very important point because when you look at the websites of SLT performing institutes, it's always mentioned, yes, you can repeat it, but it's never mentioned how often can you repeat it? Can you repeat it five times, 10 times? 
it makes only sense if the first treatment was successful, but you have a loss of efficacy, let's say after one, two or three years or later on. It makes sense to repeat it. But, and even if you repeat it then, it doesn't make sense more than to repeat it once or twice. I'm always speaking about 360 degrees, not about 180 plus 180. This is not a repetition, this is a completion. There is one interesting Arrow publication uh, from the group of New York where they were looking on the efficacy of second and third repeat selective laser trabecular plastic, and they shown nicely in this study that these patients who all got 360 degrees treatment, that there is after one or two years or even three years of intraocular pressure, control it is not too strong and you have a loss of efficacy over time and the more frequently you make it. And this is even by definition, it was enough to be successful if you reduce 20% from baseline. And 20% from baseline is not really a much. This is like a carbohydrate inhibitor. Even a better blocker alpha 2 agonist is stronger. Don't speak about prostaglandins. They are much stronger in our PLOI. So there is this hype of SLT now based on one paper from the Moorfields. It's called the LIGHT study. And I don't want to speak about this study too much. I just recommend you to read it carefully. And look what they have reached. They were not better in quality of life. They were not better in IOP lowering effect. They were not better in number of controls. It is not, it is in my mind a little bit overinterpreted and a hype which is not justified for the SLT. There's another study from the same island from the United Kingdom, which I like a lot. It's called the real world outcomes of selective laser tobacco plastic by Anthony Coria and others. And you see on the left side, one to one and a half years, on the right side, two to three years. And you have the red line. And if you see below the red line, these are the eyes where there is no uh, response on in no change in the intraocular pressure. And you see there are a lot of numbers under the red line. The green line shows the patients who have been IOP uh, doing at least 20%. And again, here you see a lot of numbers and not so many that have been successful. It's the same after two to three years, there are a lot of patients where SLT was not successful. So as a summary, SLT is easy to perform because you have the large spot size and you don't need to know the details of where is the pigmented and non-pigmented topical mesh work, like you need to know it, for example, in the agonist tobacco plastic. It's suitable for most types of glaucoma. And the compliance issue that you have with the medications where they have to take the drops every day is, of course, no problem anymore. And it has a low risk for the patient and for the doctor, and for the doctor it gives sometimes a nice morale as well. But we have to consider as well that it, the efficacy is moderate. You have a loss of time, loss of efficacy over time, like you have with medications. You have only a limited repeatability. And it's only for some patients a lifelong solution. And it's completely unclear if it's more economic because the economic data we have are so inhomogeneous because every country has different price for laser treatment, for medications, for follow-up. So you cannot say that one or the other is more economic at the moment. But again, SLT, it makes sense, but just don't be too enthusiastic with it. Thank you very much for your attention. Life. Well, that was excellent. Um, I was wondering, um, can we bring up uh, Dr. Pereira? Is uh, Shamira there? I'm sorry, he's not online. He's not. Okay. Um, well, we had some great, great lectures, I thought, today. I had a lot of pearls from our colleagues. Um, I was wondering, uh, Dr. Edmonds, um, what is the choroidal detachment rate in children? Um, I saw that you're adjusting the sutures uh, very nicely, but still with the elastic, uh, because I don't personally do that many children. Um, fortunately, uh, it's not that frequent. Um, it's more likely in eyes that have Sturge Weber choroidal hemorrhages, uh, just um, uh, more likely to get choroidal effusions and choroidal hemorrhages. I think the emphasis on tying tight and leaving the AC well formed is really, really important. Um, 
But yes, the bophthalmic eye is at much higher risk of those sorts of complications. I think, Paul, there's a question for you uh, from uh, Verna, I think from Indonesia. He's, she asked you how, how about injecting blood in a very thin blood? Um, so we, we've tried injecting autologous blood in some of those instances. Um, sometimes the, the blood is thin, however, uh, for multiple reasons. It could just be a very poor tissue, but sometimes uh, blubs are thin, again, because of the encapsulation. So I would still probably prefer at this point to needle a blood that's thin, which is caused by the fibroblasts. And then, of course, uh, uh, we could inject uh, potentially blood, but I found the transconjunctival sutures, maybe Marlene uh, can come in because you have that great video on uh, AAO. Um, I find that that also uh, helps to seal down those thin ischemic hypotenuse blubs. So, yeah, of course, caused by the fibroblasts, could and inject, then of course, uh, potentially uh, blood, but I found the transconjunctival Yes, Marlene, do you want to com comment on that? Now, uh, I find that thin ischemic hypothesis helps to seal blood. down those thin ischemic hypothesis blood. Yeah. Yeah. Of course, caused by the fibroblasts. Good, and of course, potentially. Dr. Mosler, could you please try to close the browser with the live stream? Thank you. I've been hearing things four and five times on my computers. That's uh, what, I'm, what I'm trying to explain you. Please close the browser, browser of the live feed. And unmute your microphone on go to webinar. Because you mute your microphone. But before that, please sweet close the browser with the live stream. You're still muted. Maybe we should go with another question first. Further. Yeah. Is there another question? Uh, I only see one question here. Okay. Well, I actually had a question uh, for you, uh, Seng. I was wondering, yeah. um, aside from the so proline in the Paul implant, um, no Vicryl is used to tie off the tube uh, in your technique? Yeah, I um, actually, I, I do not use uh, Vicryl to, to tie off, but uh, I, I know that the uh, Keith, Keith button uh, uses Vicryl to, to tie after his dent. Uh, but for me, uh, personally, I, I find that uh, because the tube, the ball internal diameter is quite small, uh, the 6 O proline occupies uh, quite uh, the whole tube. And uh, I find that there is no hypotony without even uh, ligating the, the tube. Have any okay. of you experienced and with the new clear path, which also has the proline in it, but I think is recommended that you do not need to tie off with the ligature as well. Have you had any experience of that or how it might compare? Not yet, not yet. Yeah, I, I heard of uh, the clear path. Uh, Paul, you have any experience with the clear path? Not yet. In Canada, uh, we haven't had that experience yet. Yeah, because we we haven't uh, we don't we don't have we don't he hasn't come to Malaysia yet. <laughs> How about Beth? Have you used it? Uh, um, I have not personally, but we have started stocking it. So a couple of my colleagues have started using it, and so far so good. Um, the the observation that I have of late is that until the bitter end, I used the S two Ahmed, and then finally now we've made the ch the change. And I'm having a lot more hypotony than I used to have. Mm -hmm. I didn't used to have to leave any visco in the AC unless it was a Sturge Weber or a child. Whereas yeah. now I'm experiencing a lot more and I'm finding that very frustrating because it used to be a pretty safe go-to. Um, has that changed any of your approaches mm -hmm. to going more to the bare belt with the ligature and less to the Ahmed? I'm on now. Uh, okay. Are you discussing Ahmed versus Barvel? 
we we are discussing the clear path have you have any experience with the clear path the new the new um, we we have experience with the clear path uh and we've not noted any major difference thus far a lot of my colleagues have tried it what we are doing is using the ahmed fp7 in a no so technique we don't we don't uh use any sutures to put the plate on and i found that once i put the plate in a pocket put it in the anterior chamber and uh make sure that the tube is well connected to the sclera with one suture under a patch graft it never moves and in order to prevent the high pressure phase of the cystic bleb, we keep people on an aqueous suppressant from the very beginning and have had excellent results with the Ahmed FP7. Uh, and very rarely do we get the old giant failures, high pressure phases, tenon cysts that we did before. So I've been using less barbells uh and many more ahmeds due to the rapidity of the surgery uh the fact that the patients do well we've also published recently or to be published that when we fill the anterior chamber with viscoelastic at the time of surgery never letting the pressure go down uh it actually made no uh improvement in the success or the morbidity post-op so it didn't seem to matter do, do you use mitomycin C with your Ahmed? No, we don't use mitomycin C. And many, many years ago, we published a paper where we put mitomycin C on a pledget for three minutes right under the plate where the bar belt or the Ahmed was going to go. And we found no improvement in the success using mitomycin C. So we do not use it. Yeah, Beth, Beth was asking with a clear path, do you get more uh, hypotony? Um, I don't think that's been a real issue. They've been tying off the clear path. I know my associate, Michael Pro, has probably put in about 10 of them. So we don't have a huge experience. I myself have not switched to clear path but he has not gotten hypotony, nor has, I believe, he's gotten any increase in success or post-operative ease of treatment. Yeah, but the clear path has got a 4-0 proline uh, stand uh, in, 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 in situ. But I know you have yeah, to our, sew uh, down the clear path. Oh, yeah. Yeah, Paul. Yeah, in our experience, well, we did publish on the Ahmed versus Bearvelt, and we just get better long-term pressures uh, with the Bearvelt. So we're still preferring the Bearvelts. Um, the other thing that I found uh, quite useful, uh, perhaps a little hint, is for Ahmed encapsulation and Ahmed failures. Instead of putting in a second to we're doing CPC, we've actually gone in to revise the fibrotic capsules over the Ahmed tubes. Uh, and once we remove them, we take a, a collagen matrix implant. Uh, we use Ologen in Canada. We dip it in mitomycin. We put it on top. We sew uh, back over. So we've been able for, uh, we published three-year data. So at least in 50% of cases, it's avoided doing further glaucoma surgery uh, aside, obviously, from the tube revision. So if someone has a failed Ahmed tube, I think it's worth considering removing the capsule, putting in the collagen matrix with some mitomycin. You know, Paul, years ago, we always unroofed all these high cystic thick tenons blebs, and we didn't find that once we cut out the fibrosis and put the whole thing back together, it made any difference. Do you think that the collagen matrix soaked in mitomycin C is making all the difference here because otherwise we just uh, don't really go back in the same place.
Yeah, no, for sure. I think it makes a difference. The other difference that we noted, we actually compared our series with and without Ologen, uh, only Mito in one group or Ologen with Mito. Uh, we actually had uh, long-term less wound dehiscence in uh, the patients where we put the collagen matrix uh, in the tube revision as well. So that was an added benefit. So it's worth a try then. I think so. It's not a long surgery, and you know we're not putting in any more hardware. Are you using 0.4 milligrams per cc? Yep. Good. Uh, yeah, Marlene. Uh, earlier, um, I think we were asking you to share your views on uh, compression switches for thin wall blabs. Sure. Uh, I'm very happy with this technique because using the very fine needle on the Ethicon 7707 10 nylon, we're able to go completely through the conjunctiva down as tightly as we can into the base of the scleral flap coming out the other way in a continuum and then close it tight. And by making these sutures radial and bit and leaving the knot, tying it three times, cutting it flush, these sutures will actually bury themselves into uh, the the blip, and you don't always have to remove them at all unless you choose to if there's astigmatism. So if there's a lot of with the rule astigmatism, you have to be careful by putting more radial tight sutures. But if not, you can have an excellent result and really bring up the pressure. I think Jesse Richmond published this years ago and showed that we've had close to 100% success in bringing the pressure up in this fashion. Thank you, thank you. Uh, Paul, I have a question for you. Um, the Evastin uh, injection uh, for, for the blabs, uh, how, how much do you use and how often do you inject? Uh, we will inject as often as the first uh, post-operative uh, day, uh, then week one and week two, depending obviously on uh, bleb vascularity. Uh, we use the typical dose that you would uh, as an anti-VEGF. Obviously, subconjunctivally, we don't expect it to stay much longer. It would be great uh, to have a device which would permit it to stay longer. Um, we do know that our patients, anecdotally, uh, that are being treated for you know, vein occlusions or uh, macular degeneration that have Avastin intravitreal injections, their blips look great. And that's what kind of pushed us to do that. I know in some countries in Europe, uh, some of our colleagues actually uh, have made uh, bevacizumab drops and they prescribe that four times a day postoperatively. I'm not sure if anyone else has seen that, but I thought that was kind of smart uh, as well. Uh, so perhaps in the future we'll be using uh, the drops. You know, we looked at using Avastin in addition to mitomycin when we needled blebs and we randomized patients. Tanya Tai did this where we randomized patients to either just mitomycin and needling or mitomycin needling plus 0.1 cc's of avastin. And believe it or not, the blebs look much, much better with the avastin, but the results were no different. So I was hugely disappointed thinking that we really would make a, an impact here within a fasting and needling of the blebs, but apparently, even though the blebs were prettier, less avascular, there was no real improvement, unfortunately. Marlene, I think that's a very important point because sometimes it takes many years for the chickens to come home to roost. And one of the downsides of these blebs that aren't so pretty means that you know the ring of steel is happening, that avascular area is getting thinner and thinner and ultimately will leak or become infected. So, you know, you may not have seen the results because it, it was too early a time point for that type of outcome. I think looking prettier means a lot. Yeah. 
uh, uh, Beth. Uh, yeah, Beth, your, your chickens come to roost uh, decades later. <laughs> um, I just had a quick question uh, regarding your uh, laser technique uh, in children for uh, cyclodestruction. Have you, uh, or is there a movement in the pediatric circle towards using micropulse? I haven't heard of a movement towards using micropulse in specifically in peds. I know there is generally. Um, uh, I think, you know, my view of, of new technologies is to, on the whole, see how they fare in adults before applying them to children. Um, and this um, business of the distorted landmarks and the stretched limbus, I think, is very relevant, partly because the sclera is very thin, but also because you want to be sure that you are treating the ciliary body. Um, so I'm still sticking with what I know works. Um, I haven't yet become aware of that being necessarily superior for children. Yeah, I, I, I was going to ask the same question as well. Uh, but with the micropulse in, in adults, I think uh, uh, the standard protocol, I think, is, is too, too mild. I mean, for especially for refractory glaucoma. So I think now uh, we, we have a new protocol called the uh, Micropulse Plus, where, uh, I mean, Paul Chiu recommended uh, 50 seconds per hemisphere, uh, but now he, he has increased it to 100 uh, seconds per hemisphere, and with additional uh, uh, pulse of, of uh, increased duty cycle of uh, 41% instead of the, the, the usual 31%, uh, extra uh, about three per quadrant. So the micropulse plus, I think, uh, works, works better. Now the, the, the point of my video was to show the transillumination technique, which I, I do for everyone. I, I think it's very interesting as well. Um, yeah. The idea that you can actually target it. And I, I'm not sure if the micropulse, how sure you are where you are in terms of yeah, where you yeah, with butamic eyes, I think is yeah, it's difficult to to be sure where you are. I, uh, one thing I have noted uh, regarding uh, micropulse, um, this is you know, interested to hear what people others have noted. Uh, I have two cases with a, a non-healing ulcer, uh, so I think sometimes even though we try to spare three and nine o'clock. Uh, and we think that this is better for the ocular surface. I've had two patients, uh, you know, not too long ago that ended up with neurotrophic ulcers with just standard parameters. So I think some very sick eyes where we try to avoid surgery, uh, which would be extremely complicated, and then we do micropulse uh, may end up uh, adversely affecting the ocular surface. Um, so I'm not sure if anyone else has, has had a case or two, but it's something to consider as potential side effects. You know, that's a big concern because there's a move to move this modality earlier and earlier in conventional treatment. Um, and it's certainly very uh, telling that a lot of different things are coming out of this, including long-term inflammation and cystoid macular edema that we didn't think would be a issue, but can be an issue moving down the road. So I think like, you know, George Spates used to say, hurry up and use something new before you see what the problems develop. <laughs> so so this uh, it's important to follow long-term. That's very important, Paul. We should all know about this. Yeah, I agree, yes. Yeah, I think if, if we do for uh, Patients with mild, milder, moderate glaucoma, they, they tend to get uh, slightly more problems uh, like uh, loss of uh, accommodation, uh, transient loss of vision, uh, but most of them are transient. I had a, a final question for you saying, uh, was uh, in your tube technique in Malaysia, do you uh, use scleral patch grafts or do you tunnel the tubes? Uh, majority of us use a scleral patch glove because uh, we we can get it uh, easily from a, a corneal bank. Yeah, so most of us uh, use a, a patch glove. How and, about uh, you, Paul? Do you do the Paul? same thing? Um, yeah, well, more and more uh, for you know some 
we do, you know, in someone where it doesn't make a huge difference, but, you know, we have put in tubes and where aesthetics are important. And in those cases, we either use some cornea or I have uh, tunneled, or sometimes, you know, you come into the OR and interesting th things happen in our OR, maybe not in yours, but you show up, you're putting the tube, they said, oh yeah, we threw it in the garbage can, the, uh, the sclera. I said, great, so I guess we'll be using the tunnel technique. So it's good to have, uh, you know, to be able to learn on the fly and do those kind of things. But um, usually we will use the scleral patch, Clara. Um. Final question for you, Beth. Uh, do you normally uh, do combine uh, tra trabeculectomy and trabeculotomy, or just plain uh, trabeculectomy alone for your children? So I don't do the combined the CTT. Um, so if it's primary congenital glaucoma, I'll start with an angle procedure, and we've very much moved to the 360 internal approach. Um, I use the Omni handpiece, which is very slick and beautiful. Um, and then if that fails, either move to a trabeculectomy or a tube, depending on the child's circumstances. Um, if it's not PCG, then once again, it depends on the age of the child. If it's juvenile open angle glaucoma, I'll often do a trabeculectomy if I know that the family can cope with that. Um, but if it's aphic glaucoma or, um, or more correctly, glaucoma following cataract surgery, um, then I'd go straight to tube. But I don't do the combined CTT. That, that, that seems to do very well in India. Yeah. Probably different patient population and also different surgical style. Um, yeah. And how about, about the GAT technique? Uh, we recently, I went in with the eye science catheter to our pediatric hospital to show our colleagues. And we had some success in juvenile uh, glaucoma. I mean, they were tr thinking of using the proline, but sometimes with the anatomy, uh, you never know where that suture is headed. And it was nice to have, you know, where, uh, where we were. And yeah. some of these younger adults, uh, we did it mostly in young teenagers and they had some, some good results. Yes, uh, the GAT is very elegant. Um, and I really enjoy using it. I, I've moved on to the Omni because it's even quicker and easier and doesn't wander, interestingly. I think yeah. that thicker filament is less likely to go into a collector channel. Um, and so it's it's perhaps a little bit more brutal, a little bit more rough because it stays in Schlem's canal, but it, it, it very rarely hits an obstruction or wanders. Um, but yes, the GAT is very elegant and very satisfying to do. In terms of the juvenile open angle glaucoma, yes, there are papers that suggest that angle procedures can sometimes work. And I will do them on occasion. On the whole, I find that they're not long lived. One, one, one usually needs to move on. Um, and it also depends when the patient presents. If it's a late presentation and the disc is already very cut, then I think one should go straight to trabeculectomy. It could buy you a few years and then you turf them off to your adult colleagues, which is great. Well, unless you're also the adult person. <laughs> 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 I can't do that. Yeah. Thank you, everyone, for a great presentation. Paul, you want to close for us? Uh, is there anything else you all want to add? No, I thought uh, we had great speakers. Uh, I'd like to thank all the panelists uh, and uh, thank everyone in the whole world which is uh, who are watching us. Uh, and uh, we're going to get through this. Hopefully, no second wave coming. And uh, these are great seminars, learning pearls from all your colleagues uh, from, uh, from the world. So hopefully, the next WOC will be live somewhere. I would have preferred sipping some South African wine, but you know, <laughs> such is life. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.